Building your own personal brand is critical to being a top producer influencer. You always want to mesmerize your audience. Open with a hook. So guys, I'm going out today. Yellow's back in style and I'm ready to go. Why are you doing? You are grounded. You are not going anywhere. Ma! Listen to your followers. Hey guys, so you recommended that I try this new blush. So we're going to be doing that today. Oh my gosh, blends like a dream. Highly recommend. Break, break, break. Oh my, get it off, get it off. Be authentic. Yo, what's up, YouTube? Just flew into Cabo San Lucas. Be sure to like and subscribe. Happy to be here. Most of all, serve a purpose. Hey guys, as you know, health is super important. So try my jalapeno asparagus smoothie recipe. Link's in my bio. <laughs> Ew! <laughs> and that's how you build your brand. Good morning, everybody. My name is Terry. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to welcome you as we're in the middle of this message series entitled Build Your Brand. We've been taking a look at a book in the Bible called the book of James. James is the half-brother of Jesus Christ, and James writes a very practical book on what it means to be a follower of Jesus in a very cultural and practical sense. And so the reason why we say build your brand is we're learning what it means that if we say we're a follower of Jesus, then we need to follow some of the very pra practical attributes that James calls us to have so that others will know exactly what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And today, we're gonna talk about a topic that I think every single person in this room, watching online, in the balcony, we could all connect with. And that is the battle of the tongue. And now I would tell you, before we even get started, if you're watching this message and at the end of this message you say, you know what? I'm doing great on all these. Everything is perfect, everything's wonderful. Do me a favor, I wanna meet you personally today. I wanna find out what makes you tick because man, I, you know, I, I, am, I am just fawning over you because if you can handle this, then you've got it going on. The truth is though, I think every single one of us that watches this um, will find areas where we say, man, I didn't know I can't do that. I didn't know that that was sinful, oh goodness. But hopefully, for some of you, it might encourage you in the right method of communication. So rather than continue on, we're going to jump into this book. Chapter 3, James begins, and he begins to talk about the tongue and how dangerous it can be in all of our lives. James, chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 3, and here we go. He says this, brothers and sisters, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Now, Right off the bat, James begins to, to try and illustrate and use a couple of examples to let us know how powerful the tongue is. And he uses two pictures, and we're going to talk about those pictures first. First thing he says is he talks about a horse. And did you know this, that a horse can lift 550 pounds on its back without even breathing heavy? 550 pounds. I know me, whenever I've gone horseback riding, I always look at the horse and go, sorry, buddy, you're going to have a painful day. You know, because we think we're hurting the animal. But the truth is, that horse doesn't even break a sweat with me on his back. He can carry 550 pounds. However, did you know this? That you could take a 100-pound small child and put it on its back, and if it puts a bridle in its mouth, the horse could be made to dance. It could be directed in any which way that the child would want it to go. So he uses the picture that a horse, it's powerful. The tongue is powerful, but we have the power to tame that tongue. He also uses about the illustration and the picture of a fire, and he says a small spark can cause great damage. And for those of you that love history, you heard about the great Chicago fire. This is my hometown. On October 8th, 1871, Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern. Three and a half miles of the city was destroyed. 17,000 buildings. It lasted two days, and it cost 250 lives. One small spark created devastation. And that's why James speaks of the tongue being so difficult that we have to 
pay attention. And so right off the bat, he grabs my attention. In those first few verses, he says, Sherry, you don't even think about your tongue, do you? You don't even think about what comes out of it sometimes. And I want you to know that, yes, while that happens, you can cause harm. He continues on in verse 6, and he says this, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Now, this is why I love scripture because there's so much in this. And if you're new to studying the Bible, new to looking at this, you might like, well, that was harsh, you know, and, and you just don't think anything out of it. But he mentions a couple things. He mentions, obviously, the spark that it can set, but then he illustrates it and compares it to hell. And he says that our whole bodies, if we're not careful, our tongues can set us on a course to live a life in essence where we're directing and we're doing everything through evil, which matches it then to hell. Well, what was James talking about? Now, I want you to understand this. This is where we kind of learn a little bit. If you don't like history, then you can go to take a nap for about five minutes, and then I'll wake you up. Okay, ready? Here we go. James is the half-brother of Jesus, right? James is living in and around Jerusalem. James would have seen Jerusalem growing up as a, as a kid because James and his family would have been taking sacrifices to the city of David in Jerusalem and so in, the, in, in that area and above, and he would have been doing that constantly. Well, there is a valley in Jerusalem. And it is on this western and south side of the area. And it's called the Hinnom Valley. And the Hinnom Valley in this area, it was the lower part of the mountain. So I want you to imagine this and picture this, and I'm going to show you a picture in a second. That in the city of David, which is Jerusalem, above today, Jerusalem sits a little higher than the city of David. I'm going to show you this. But in that time, the individuals of that town, it's good to live higher than lower, Correct. There's an old saying that a lot of stuff flows downhill. You ever heard that? Well, it is practical in this day and age because the Hinnom Valley was the place where all of the garbage and all of the trash and all of the sewage would flow down to. And so what would the people do at night if they just left it there and, and didn't do anything? It would cause disease and it could cause hardship. So in that time, guess what they did? They lit it on fire and they would burn all the refuse in that area. So if you went to the city of David, if you went to Jerusalem, and you traveled there to give sacrifices, on the western and southern end, in the Hinnom Valley, you would see constant fires all day long. And James was illustrating that, hey, brothers and sisters, I want you to be careful. Your tongue can set a fire like what you see in the Hinnom Valley. So the first thing he says is, hey, you know how that fire is always burning? You know how there's nothing good that comes out of the Hinnom Valley? Well, that's like your tongue. And if you're not careful, you're going to cause yourself so much pain, so many years of hardship if you're not careful with the tongue. Now, guess what? This is why, it's, this is why I geek out. I got two and a half more minutes before I wake people up. Okay, so hang with me. So listen. So he's the half-brother of Jesus, right? Well, he heard his brother once talk about hell. And hell is Gehen. And that's a word for hell. And Jesus mentions Gehen. And when Jesus mentions it, Jesus actually points to the Hinnom Valley. And Jesus at one time says, hey, you want to know what hell's like? Take a look at the Hinnom Valley. Now, why would Jesus say this? It wasn't just because there's always fire. Yes, that was a word picture. But did you know this? Did you know that during times of evil in Jerusalem, when not godly leaders but ungodly leaders took the mantle and the throne and the kingship of Israel, is during those times they would worship false idols. They would also not sacrifice animals to the one and true God. Instead, they would begin to sacrifice children to false and fake gods. And they would build on the Hinnom Valley, historical records show, they would build altars made of rock and stone. And they would sacrifice children so the blood of a child would flow down into the Hinnom Valley at that time. And everybody in Jerusalem knew the history of that area. And when they looked at the Hinnom Valley, they saw garbage, they saw refuse, they saw fire, but they also had the memories of the sacrifices of their own children. And so Jesus illustrated hell by pointing to a picture of the Hinnom Valley. And James says, you want to know how dangerous your tongue is? Brothers and sisters here at Ocean View, or if you're watching and you're just attending, do you know how dangerous our tongue is? 
It has the power to put us on a course to the Hinnom Valley. Here's a picture of the Hinnom Valley as you see today. Today in Jerusalem you have the Temple Mount and Herod later on, he flattens the mountain and he puts the Temple Mount and today you could walk on that Temple Mount today. But did you know this, that they excavated down below and they found the original place of Jerusalem, the city of David, and they found the artifacts. They found all of the geographical evidence that the Bible speaks about, guess what? They have been founding and confirming time and time again and that all flows down into a field of blood known as the Hinnon Valley. And so the tongue is dangerous. So those of you that don't like history, time to wake up, because we're gonna get practical. And so what we wanted to do is, we wanted to talk in practicality about what James is talking about. So if you were to ask me, Pastor Terry, what are the areas that we fall into just difficulties? And what are the maybe five areas of the tongue that we need to watch? And so I, I deem this the enemies of the tongue. And here's the first one, which most of us know. First one right off the bat is gossip. It's gossip. Proverbs 18.8 says this about gossip. It says, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. You know what the, the writer is saying to us? Gossip is easy. In our human state, we love as human beings, we love gossip. It is just natural for our human state. We crave it, and when we do it, and when we gossip, oh, it makes our inmost parts feel so good. And that's what we have to watch out for, because just because it feels good doesn't mean it's necessarily right. And so, Terry, when you talk about gossip, what are some ways? I don't want to gossip anymore. I don't want to do that. So what I've done is I put a list. If you've ever heard someone say these things, or maybe you yourself have said these things, Beware of the tongue. Take a look at this list. These are gossip cues. You ever said, have you heard? Have you ever said, hey, did you know? Hey, they tell me, and by the way, when you ever hear someone say they tell me, your first question should be, who is they? Who is they? Keep this to yourself. I wouldn't tell you this, but I know it's not going to go any further. Isn't that true as Christians? Sometimes we do that. You know what? You know, I, you know, you're my dear friend, and you know, this isn't gossip because I know it's not going to go beyond me and you, and this is just going to make us feel really good together. No, it's gossip. And then, of course, if you're not a Christian in this room or not a Christian watching online, this is where you can laugh at us Christians because here's what we like to do to mask gossip. We say, hey, I'm telling you this so that you can pray for dear old Susie. Did you hear about Susie? Did you hear about her husband? Oh, well, you know what, it's, it's awful, but you know what, we're gonna pray for them, so it's okay for me to tell you because it's a prayer request, so we should pray. In fact, we should get the whole church together and we should pray for them and tell them it's okay because it's helping them. No, it's gossip. So the first one is gossip. Here's a second one that many of us might not understand what it is, innuendo. Some of us, we use innuendo all the time. Let me kind of illustrate this another way. There's an old story of a captain on a boat. And a captain has to write a captain's log. You ever seen that before? And so every day they document what happens on the boat. And so the captain was monitoring his ship and his first mate had a rough night. And the next day, the, apparently, the rough night continued on in the morning. And so at the end of the day, the captain takes out his log and he writes down this. First mate drunk today. Well, all of a sudden, the first mate sees the log and he's upset. He's angry. And so then he goes in and he decides he's going to start a first mate log because he wants everybody to see what he documents. So in the next day, using innuendo, here's what he wrote. Captain sober today. <laughs> innuendo. If you've ever used innuendo, here are some cues for you. Word that goes unsaid. Have you ever been in there where they said, hey, so how's Susie doing? Is she doing okay? How's the salad? Word goes unsaid. Awkward silence. By the way, I just did all four of these in one shot. Word unsaid, awkward silence. If you know me, I can raise my eyebrow. Let me tell you. I can do it. And then a quizzical look. You ever look at someone where they've got indigestion and they really don't? That's probably when they use innuendo. Here's one that I think most Christians think is acceptable. And right now, I'm going to make a lot of you unhappy. You know, I moved to the South about eight years ago, and there's a lot of wonderful things that I love about the South that I'm just so thankful for. And then there are some things about the South that I've learned, and this is one of them. One of the dangers and enemies of the tongue, flattery. Flattery. Now, some of you say, well, Terry, what's flattery? Well, 
in order for us to understand what flattery is, we have to have a baseline, right? So all of us, we kind of know what gossip is, right? But just in case, let's set the baseline. Gossip is this. Gossip is saying something behind someone's back that you wouldn't want to say to someone's face. All of us agree? Everybody, all God's children said? Wow, that was about 20% of the room, which means that only 20% of you are taking this seriously. The other 80% is like, I don't care. I love gossip. I'm just going to continue to do it. No, that's gossip. Saying something behind someone's back that you wouldn't say to his face. Well, let me tell you what flattery is. Flattery is saying something to someone's face that you would never say behind their back. Susie, you look beautiful today. Oh my gosh, that dress is just amazing on you. It's incredible. Oh, it's wonderful. And then you say, have a nice day. It's great. That dress is ugly as sin. I'm just saying, oh my gosh. Flattery. Now let's get serious for a moment. Flattery can damage someone for their life. I think back when I was a high school and a college baseball coach, I was guilty of flattery. And I never thought about it. Because here's the truth, sometimes we can use flattery and we have all the right intentions, but it's still wrong. Because I can remember some of the athletes that were really struggling and I would work with them and try to encourage them. And then they would say, coach, do you really think, do you think that I could get drafted? And I would look at them and because I didn't want to hurt their feelings or because I didn't want them to feel, you know, that they weren't going to make it and kill their confidence. Of course I do. Yes, you've got all that it takes. You absolutely, you can hit so much better. You can hit 500 this year if you really try. Meanwhile, I would go home and I would go, you know, that kid, he's going to get cut. He is just, he's not going to make it. But I, I, I masked it in an encouragement. I want to encourage this person. And there's nothing wrong with encouragement. But you know what? Here's the truth. We can be truthful with our encouragement. I could look at that same young man and say, look, I don't know whether you're going to get drafted or not. That's not the point. The point is every day we want to get better. And so here's the truth. If you every day work hard to get better, you will have more success. And I can say that and be honest because that is true in life. But I don't have to go beyond that. Some of us feel that we have to flatter someone by going on and telling mistruths when the truth is it's not the truth. Proverbs 29.5 says this about flattery. Those who flatter their neighbors are spreading nets for their own feet. Proverbs 26, 28 says this, a lying tongue, which guess what? That's flattery. A lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. A couple of theologians that I respect said this about lying and flattery, and they said this, only pain and ruin can come from deception. Anytime you deceive someone with your words, only pain and ruin can come from it. And truth is vital and pride fatal to right decisions. And so we need to start taking seriously. Remember what James said? It's as powerful as a 550 pound carrying horse. The fourth one is really difficult. And the fourth one enemy of the tongue is criticism. Now, here's the truth. There are many of us in this room on the balcony watching online. There are many of us, depending on our wiring of our personalities, we have tendencies that either lead to criticism or lead to encouragement. There are many personalities. For instance, some of you in this room can go in, in a day, you can give 15 compliments and only give one criticism. And then the opposite is true of some of you, where your own personalities, you will find 15 criticisms and only give one compliment. I'm not saying one is wrong over the other, but what I am saying is, is we have to guard the tongue either way. We have to guard our flattery, but we also have to guard our criticism. A fun story that I was told that is written down. John Wesley, famous pastor of old, father of the faith. John Wesley is in church one time and doing an early church service. And in that church service, there was a little old lady who came up to him. And she took umbrage towards what he was wearing. He had ties. And back in those days, they had the ties that were longer strings. And he was wearing a tie that was a little longer than usual. And the woman walked up to John Wesley and said, sir, may I give you a criticism? And John Wesley said, oh, by all means. And she said, can I, can I help you to be better? Sure thing. Your ties are an offense to me, is what she said. They are an offense to me. 
And so John Wesley said, ma'am, I'm very, very sorry. So I wish I had the wisdom of John Wesley. He turned around, he went to the drawer, and he pulled out a pair of scissors. And he looked at the lady, he says, I, by all means, I'm sorry that these are an offense to you. Here's some scissors. Can you trim them to where you'd like them to be? So the lady went and trimmed the ties and got them to where she wants to be. And he said, is this the right way? Yes, it is. I feel so much better now. So John Wesley, in turn, looked back and said, madam, may I give a correction to you? She goes, by all means. And he said this, your tongue is an offense to me. So please stick your tongue out. I'd like to take some of it off. <laughs> Criticism is dangerous. I'll give one last thing. A long time ago in our church, I said this. We can always agree to disagree as brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're not a Christian, pay close attention. If you're a follower of Jesus, we are, we are held up to a moral code by the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, then our responsibility is no matter the brother or the sister, no matter how they talk, no matter how they look, no matter how they act, if they're a follower of Jesus, then I might agree to disagree strongly with someone. So it's not a matter of being a pacifist. It's a matter I can disagree strongly with my brother. But I will always, while I agree to disagree, I will always agree with my brother. I will always agree with my sister because they are a brother and sister in Christ. And so at the end of the day, you are my brother, you are my sister, I love you, I will pray for you, I will always agree with you. But on this moment, I agree to disagree with you. Does that make sense? So we have to be careful with our criticisms. Number five, enemy of the tongue, diminishment. Diminishment. In the New American Standard Version, in James, in, in verse 11, James says this in chapter four. He says, do not speak against one another, brethren. And I like to say this about diminishment. When you diminish someone else, it is the equivalent in the Christian world, it's the equivalent of Christian slander. Because here's what we do sometimes. We mask diminishing someone doing God's job. Well, you know what, that guy, he said, so we gossip. Did you hear what he said in the hallways of church? He said this, 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 and this. It is wrong, it is not right, and so we need to stand against it. And so what we do is we diminish someone and the truth is, is we mask it into we're doing something for God. It's as if we're in God's army. In fact, in the book of Judges 7.20, it says this. It says, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Now, that might be powerful and wonderful, but we use that in the hallways at church about gossip to justify our gossip, to justify our criticism. I'm doing this for the Lord. You know what? I went to the person. I gave him a one-two because God's not happy with him. No. Diminishment is never okay. It is never okay to push someone down to raise yourself up. I close. I close with this. The tongue is so powerful, it has affected the human history of our world. And if you're a history major, you're going to know this battle and rebellion. But let me tell you the story. Back in 1899, there were four newspaper reporters and those newspaper reporters, they, were, they gathered on a Thursday, they had their you know, conference, and they got to Saturday night, and for newspaper reporters, the Sunday edition was coming out. And the Sunday edition has to have amazing headlines. It has to have head turners. For those of you under the age of 25, the, the newspaper, something delivered to your house, and you look at them, Sundays are amazing, they have ads. God bless the ads, we miss the ads, but anyway. So these newspaper reporters are there, and. They hang around the train station Saturday night hoping to see something that happens so that they could write about it. And they all go to a saloon. This is a true story. They all go to a saloon and they have nothing. And they're all worried about their jobs because they have to write for the next day. So one of the newspaper reporters says, I've got an idea. What if we make up a story? We make up a story about another country. This is 1899, no internet, you know, phones. No. Make up a story and we'll make sure that it's far away and we will be lauded for finding this information out locally and we'll be heroes of the day and no one is worse for wear. It'll be great. So all four newspaper reporters, they, they strategize, they put a creative think tank together. And so here's what they do. They come up with an idea to say in the Sunday paper that the Chinese government has contracted foreign governments and employees to come to China to tear down the Great Wall of China. 
And in fact, I think we have a picture of the Sunday newspaper. Take a look at this. And if you look on the right-hand side, it says, Great Wall of China. Chicago man wants the contract. And that's a picture of it. So the newspaper reporters are lauded. Everything seems great. Unbeknownst to them, word gets out in China, in the area of Peking, which is this area. And there's a secret society of Chinese nationalists who are trying and gather together to protect the Chinese heritage, and they are not for the expansion or some of the ways that the current government is going in China. And so when these nationalists find out that there are foreign nationals that are gonna be coming in and they're gonna be tearing down their great wall, all of a sudden they murder over 200, 250 missionaries from other countries because it was the missionaries that are living in the land. Missionaries from six countries, citizens murdered. Six countries in response send 12,000 troops to China and a conflict begins around the Peking area. And that conflict is known in history as the Boxer Rebellion. All because four newspaper columnists decided to lie so they could get attention. So here's my question to you. Do you know how much damage your tongue can do to your family? Do you know how much damage your tongue can do to your friends? Let me in fact give you a survey and I want you to read this and I want you to ask yourself these questions. Do you talk too much? Guilty. Do you pass information about others onto people with joy? Do you say to people's faces what you would never say behind their backs? Do you have a sharp tongue? And are people elevated or diminished by your tongue? Our responsibilities as followers of Jesus, I don't think I could put it any better than John 17, 17. And it says this, we are to sanctify them by the truth because our words are the truth. And do you know what sanctification means? It means the growing. It means the building. It means to be Christ-likeness. It means to be coming more and more like Jesus Christ every single day. So what we read is that our responsibility is to build one another up, not tear one another down, to help one another with truth, to be more like Jesus. And God forgive me for my family, my friends, for the times that I've enjoyed the enemies of the tongue and I don't do what God calls me to do. So the choice is ours today. Will we battle the tongue? Would you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for this day. God, right now, I, I lift everyone in this room up, everyone watching online. God, this is too important. I pray against the enemy for telling all of us that it's not too bad. God, the truth is, is that our tongues can cause havoc in someone's life. God, forgive us for the havoc we've caused and we don't even realize it, for the people that have been hurt and we don't even know about it. God, I need to be more careful with my tongue. And so, Lord, I pray for all of us that we would fight to control our tongues. God, I pray that all of us in this room, whatever you call us to do with regards to asking for forgiveness, that we would have the strength to go to a person and say, forgive me, forgive me for what I've said. But God, today I thank you that your truth is why I'm alive. You died on a cross for my sins and because of that, I'm alive. And I'll be alive for eternity because you're my savior. And I pray for everyone in this room that they would have that same saving knowledge. So God, we bless you today. And we give our lives to you. Strengthen us. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen.